If you're a fan of our evolution of vehicles and uniforms videos, check out our last project from this series on the evolution of French uniforms. With its thick ancient forests and sprawling countryside, Germany has always been a nation with a rich hunting tradition. If you've ever wanted to experience the thrill of hunting for yourself, then why not try out the sponsor of today's video, Hunting Clash, a free-to-play mobile game that takes on the ambitious task of replicating the thrill of trophy hunting, while hopefully keeping the player safe from mosquitoes, vengeful predators, adverse weather, and angry park rangers. Take on various skill challenges and carefully stalk your prey in amazingly detailed locations like Namibia, Yukon, Burma, and Lapland. Additionally, players can compete in duels, tournaments, and even championships, or join a clan and take part in exclusive events to win prizes like legendary lures. Prove yourself the most skilled hunter of the pack and bring home the big game, be they deadly carnivores or stealthy, elusive herbivores. Download the game for free from the link in the description. New players can use the gift code HUNTWITHGRIFFIN for a special reward of 100 gold, 70 skill tokens to upgrade your skills, and two mythical lure cards so you can hunt bigger animals for a total value of $15. During the early stages of the Great War, aerial combat was a haphazard, improvised affair that started out with rival pilots trading pot shots with rifles and service revolvers. These were quickly replaced by machine guns mounted on rails and turrets but these weapons were unable to fire directly forwards without destroying the propeller of the plane carrying them. Enter the Fokker Eindecker in 1915, an otherwise unremarkable monoplane turned terror of the skies via the introduction of a cowl-mounted 7.92mm machine gun with a trigger mechanism synchronized with the rotation of the propeller. This tiny monoplane would be credited with over a thousand kills during the Great War, and started the Fokker Scourge, where Eindeckers dominated the skies over Europe for months on end. By early 1916, Entente biplanes with their own synchronized guns were emerging to put an end to the Fokker Scourge. This allowed the Albatross company to step in and pick up the slack with their Albatross D series, which featured improved aerodynamic fuselages and twin machine guns. Hundreds were produced, with the design being incrementally improved right up until the end of the war. It was in this aircraft that Manfred von Richthofen earned the title of Red Baron, and was the first one to sport his signature scarlet color scheme. While the Eindecker was a crude design with a single innovation, Fokker's own D4 biplane was a cutting-edge machine that raced off the production line after testing by the Red Baron himself. Although only used for 10 months before the end of the war, the D4 amassed such a reputation that the Entente powers demanded the entire surviving stock as war prizes after the armistice. Surprisingly enough, the Red Baron himself did not fly a Fokker D4 during the remainder of the war, but instead used a Fokker DR-1 triplane as his personal aircraft. With its triple-wing arrangement, the Drydecker could outturn and outclimb most contemporary opponents, but was inferior in many other aspects due to the added drag and extra mass of the third wing. Between 1914 and 1916, Germany made extensive use of its large Zeppelin fleet to conduct aerial reconnaissance and strategic bombing raids across the English Channel. Contrary to popular perception, Zeppelins were virtually immune to conventional ammunition and often limped home with gas bags perforated by thousands of rounds. This all changed with the introduction of incendiary bullets, turning the entire remaining fleet into floating target practice for the Entente. To replace its now obsolete Zeppelins, the Central Powers invested in the first long-range bombers, produced primarily by the Gotha Company. Carrying 1,500 pounds of ordnance, the Gotha series was the flying fortress of the biplane era, easily able to defend itself with up to three turret-mounted machine guns. 
1934, the German Air Ministry embarked on a program to replace its fleet of aging biplanes with a modernized all-metal monoplane with an enclosed cockpit. German engineers Walter Rethel and Willy Messerschmitt rose to the challenge, competing against much more well-established companies to produce the BF-109 prototype within just one year. The design was battle-tested in 1937 when examples were flown by the Luftwaffe Condor Legion during the Spanish Civil War, where it utterly dominated the competition despite only being armed with a pair of 7.92 machine guns. Giddy with success, Messerschmitt began a series of rapid iterations on the original design, resulting in the E or Emil model airframe that entered the Second World War. This model introduced the ability to carry small bombs for ground support, but also offered a huge upgrade in firepower thanks to the installation of two 20mm cannons in the wings. By now, many fighters were resistant to light machine gun fire, with organizations like the RAF assuming a minimum of 300 rounds would be needed to down most aircraft. Meanwhile, a well-aimed 20mm high-explosive projectile could blow the wing clean off any fighter in one shot. Quickly following the Emil, 1941 saw the Friedrich variant of the 109 take flight into the skies across Europe. Fitted with a more powerful engine, a streamlined fuselage, and rounded wings, the F-Series was a superb jack-of-all-trades design, competitive with any contemporary fighter. The F-Series also removed the wing-mounted guns, replacing them with single 20mm cannon firing through the propeller hub. Still, the ever-evolving nature of war meant that newer versions just had to be produced, and in 1942, the BF-109G, or Gustav, rolled off of the production line. The most successful and prolific version of the 109, the Gustav had an amazing 16 variants and fought in every major theater of the war from 1942 all the way up to 1945. The final iteration on Messerschmitt's legendary design was the 109K, or Kerfurst. Only appearing after January of 1945, the Kerfurst pushed its delicate chassis to the limit, thanks to an engine capable of producing up to 2,000 horsepower. This final iteration was a match for any Allied fighter, but ultimately far too few were produced to affect the outcome of the war. The breakout success of the 109 did not discourage competition from other German manufacturers. Engineer Kurt Waldemar Tank of the Focke-Wulf company quickly realized that it was pointless trying to build a similar fighter, as it would only cause competition for the limited supply of Daimler-Benz inline engines that most fighters used at the time. His prototype FW-190 instead used a radial engine that was easier to manufacture and maintain. In addition to a solid, durable airframe, the 190A1 featured two 20mm cannons and four 7.92 machine guns. After serving well during the opening stages of the war, the 190 received extensive upgrades, resulting in the fearsome A4 model commonly known as the Verger, or Butcher Bird. Now with four cannons, the A-4 could disintegrate any Allied fighter with one click of the trigger, and was also known for its incredible roll rate, dive speed, and vertical maneuvering ability. By 1944, Allied high-altitude bombers were busy pounding German infrastructure to rubble, and the focke wolf 190 was one of the airframes redesigned to counter this threat. The new D-Series replaced the radial engine with a turbocharged inline engine optimized for high-altitude flight. This gave the FW-190 a near-unparalleled climb rate and service ceiling of nearly 40,000 feet, or 12,000 meters. Despite its capabilities, the D-Series was soon reassigned to more standard fighter interception and even ground attack roles as the Luftwaffe began introducing jet fighters to its lineup. Towards the end of the war, many older radial-engined 190s were refitted as ground attackers, ensuring the 190 remained useful until the very end of the war. Another famous workhorse of the Third Reich was the Ju-87, a robust, gull-winged aircraft fitted with dive brakes that made it one of the world's first true dive bombers. 
First tested in the mid-1930s, the Stuka would be deployed alongside the 109 by the Condor Legion, where it immediately excelled in its intended role. Following the outbreak of war in Europe, the Ju-87B struck morbid terror into the hearts of infantry across Poland and France thanks to its iconic sirens, but these were actually only used for a brief period of time due to the amount of drag they added to the airframe. While dozens of Ju-87 variants were made, the most interesting is the Ju-87G, also known as the Kanonenvogel, or Cannonbird, which featured two underslung 37mm anti-tank cannons. Though horribly slow and ungainly, the improvised design was a fearsome ground attack aircraft, allowing Stuka aces like Hans Ulrich Rudel to amass dozens of kills on the Eastern Front. While best known for the 109, Messerschmitt produced many other designs during the Second World War. Among these was the BF-110 Zerstorer, or Destroyer, a twin-engined heavy fighter. The BF-110 stands out as perhaps one of the most misused aircraft in the war, being forced into the role of a bomber escort during the Battle of Britain, where it proved easy prey for single-engine fighters. The 110 chassis did prove very adaptable, however, and during the later stages of the war, the G-Series would operate as capable bomber interceptors, even mounting 37mm cannons and radar arrays for night combat. Another fascinating modification were the Schrega Musik, vertical cannons fitted in the canopies of select 110Gs. These allow the craft to cruise directly below enemy bombers and fire up at them from much lower altitudes. Not all German aircraft needed guns to have a major impact on the battlefield. The tiny Fieseler Fi-156 Storch, or Stork, was a lightweight scout plane that performed many vital roles during the war, such as transporting commanders between sectors, spotting for artillery batteries, and even deploying paratrooper squads. With the ability to take off with less than 50 meters of runway, the 156 could operate anywhere in just about any condition. Deposed Italian dictator Benito Mussolini was rescued from the Gran Sasso mountaintop using a stork, and captured examples were so popular with the Allies that Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery used one as a personal transport plane. The workhorse of the Luftwaffe was the simple Ju-52, a versatile cargo plane that first took flight in 1930 and would go on to outlive the Nazi cause by more than 30 years. Though sometimes armed with a few light machine guns for emergencies, the Ju-52 was more noteworthy for its unusual tri-motor engine configuration and innovative features such as the early autopilot system and rugged skin of corrugated duralumin. Hitler's personal transport was a modified J-52, and the sturdy airframe made it an ideal choice for paratrooper operations, being able to hold up to 18 soldiers and their equipment. The one critical weakness of the German Air Force lay in its total lack of heavy strategic bombers. Instead, the most common German bomber was the Heinkel 111, a pre-war design initially built as a civilian airliner, but deliberately made for easy conversion to military service. The 111 served well in massed bomber formations over Poland and France, but quickly proved inadequate during the Battle of Britain. While able to carry a versatile payload, the 111 never had more than a few machine guns for point defense, and was much too slow to outrun enemy fighters, sharply limiting its potential effectiveness. This is not to say Germany lacked effective bombers, as the Dornier 217 series would handedly demonstrate. With a solid airframe, powerful engines, and similar profile to the BF-110, the 217 was another design that could do just about anything the Luftwaffe needed it to. Though first used as a reconnaissance plane, the DO-217K was modified with a large internal bomb bay that could be filled with regular ordnance or hold the advanced Fritz X guided bomb. Other variants could even deploy the Henschel HS-293 guided anti-ship missile, technically making it one of the first missile-armed planes in history. In a further effort to fill the strategic bomber-sized gap in their air force, the Luftwaffe commissioned the Heinkel 177 in 1942. 
This ambitious design featured four twin-linked engines in two nacellas and remote-controlled gun turrets. With a maximum payload of nearly 16,000 pounds, the HE-177 compared quite favorably to the American B-17 Flying Fortress in most aspects, and over a thousand were produced. Unfortunately, the highly experimental airframe and convoluted engine layout was an absolute maintenance nightmare, and in combination with severe fuel shortages, this meant that most of the HE-177 fleet never saw action. As the war dragged on and the balance of power tipped against the Axis, German engineers began desperately searching for a miracle solution. Experiments with jet engines had been going on since 1942, and in mid-1944, the first ever jet fighter took flight in the form of the ME-262. Known as the Schwalbe, or Swallow, the 262A1 used two Junkers Jumo axial flow turbojet engines to reach speeds of up to 530 miles or 850 kilometers per hour. Initially armed with four 30mm cannons, the 262 could also carry bombs and rockets. This aircraft excelled in the role of bomber hunter, but ironically the primitive jet engines lacked the acceleration or maneuverability of prop aircraft, and several of these cutting-edge fighters were shot down when their pilots foolishly chose to dogfight much more nimble allied aircraft that they could have easily outrun. While the 262 was successful, it was also expensive, complex, and very maintenance-intensive. The Heinkel Company's Volksjäger, or People's Fighter, offered a more economical alternative, using a single BMW turbojet mounted on a tiny wooden frame. Armed with two 20 or 30 mm cannons, depending on the variant, this tiny fighter displayed many innovative characteristics, like its streamlined airframe and experimental ejection system, but came far too late in the war to have any appreciable impact. In 1957, the West German Air Force officially requested that NATO provide them with a modern fighter aircraft, prompting Lockheed Martin to produce a special redesign of its F-104 Starfighter just for the Luftwaffe. Though enthusiastically dubbed the Super Starfighter due to its improved engine, uptuned avionics, and enhanced payload, the F-104G was quickly given a much less flattering moniker by its pilots, Witwenmacher, aka Widowmaker. A ridiculous 292 out of nearly 1,000 aircraft would be lost to crashes, killing 116 pilots. Although the cause of this disaster was eventually identified as issues with pilot training on supersonic aircraft, the Luftwaffe began seeking a replacement as early as the 1960s. By the late 1960s, companies like Heinkel and Messerschmitt had rebuilt enough to start regular collaboration with other NATO engineering firms. In 1969, the United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands created an international company with the sole duty of producing new multi-role jet aircraft utilizing variable geometry wings. The result was the Panavia Tornado, introduced in 1979 and still in active service today. Tornadoes conducted the first German offensive air operation since the Second World War, being part of the NATO intervention in the Kosovo War in 1999. The considerable success of the tornado prompted further collaboration between the various NATO powers. In the 1980s, work began on another multi-role aircraft, this time with an advanced canard delta-wing airframe. The long and complicated project was further hampered by the economic upheaval caused by the reunification of Germany in 1990, but eventually resulted in the Eurofighter Typhoon, which made its first flight in 2003. 2003 also saw the introduction of the Eurocopter Tiger, an advanced attack helicopter whose design requirements were based on the Cold War demand for anti-tank helicopters to combat the threat of a Soviet armored invasion of Europe. Designed in collaboration with the French, the Tiger was the first European helicopter to have a chassis built purely from radar-absorbent composite materials. Considered a major success, the Tiger has so far seen combat in Libya, Mali, and Afghanistan, under both French and German operators.
Special thanks again to Hunting Clash for sponsoring this video. Start amassing hunting trophies immediately by downloading the game for free through the link in the description below. And don't forget to use our gift code HUNTWITHGRIFFIN for a total of $15 worth of in-game bonuses.